This is lesson 10 on fluid mechanics in medicine, and the topic is viscosity and Poisier's law. The learning objective here is to understand how the resistance of a tube is related to its length, its radius, and the fluid's viscosity. The first thing to discuss is the concept of viscosity. Imagine we have a straight tube or pipe, and it's filled with water moving left to right. The water, of course, is made up of tiny molecules of H2O, and while the net motion of the molecules on average is in a certain direction, individual molecules don't flow in a smooth, coordinated way. Instead, various intermolecular forces between neighboring molecules are causing some pushing and some pulling this way and that, resulting in an internal friction within the fluid. Viscosity, which is usually denoted by lowercase mu, is a measure of a fluid's resistance to flow and deformation by stress due to this internal friction. It approximates the common notion of thickness. For example, water seems inherently thin as far as fluids go, and that's the consequence of a relatively low viscosity. While maple syrup, or even more so molasses, is very thick and has a very high viscosity. Viscosity is dependent upon temperature, but essentially independent of pressure. The first part of this statement may seem obvious to anyone who cooks a lot. Sauces, for example, seem to become thinner as they heat up in a pan and thicker as they cool down. Viscosity becomes a critical component of the relationship between a pressure gradient along the length of a tube and that tube's length and radius. And here is that relationship. For a tube with length L and radius R, the pressure gradient in the fluid as measured between two points along a tube is equal to eight times the viscosity of the fluid times the length of distance between the points times the rate of fluid flow, all divided by pi times the radius to the fourth power. This is known as Poisier's law. If we remember that the pressure gradient equals flow times resistance, we can quickly derive a corollary to Poisier's law, which is more important in medicine than the law itself. The resistance of fluid to flow is equal to eight times viscosity times L divided by pi times radius to the fourth. The dramatic feature of this relationship, as we'll see in a moment, is that fourth power. While length has a modest role in determining the resistance in the tube or resistance in the blood vessel, the radius is much, much more important. Small changes in radius can result in dramatic changes in resistance. Let's take a look at some common medical applications of this. A hypotensive patient requires immediate infusion of intravenous saline. If the goal is to infuse the saline as fast as possible, which is the preferred route of administration? A standard triple lumen central line whose length is 20 centimeters and the radius of each lumen is 0.84 millimeters, or a standard 16 gauge peripheral IV whose length is 4 centimeters and the radius of which is 1.2 millimeters. Let's start with a corollary to Poisier's law. We can compare the resistance to fluid in the central line with resistance to flow in the peripheral IV. If this ratio is greater than one, resistance in the central line is greater, so the peripheral IV would be better for rapid infusion. And if the ratio is less than one, resistance in the IV is greater, so we should go with the central line. If we substitute in eight times viscosity times length divided by pi r to the fourth in both the numerator and denominator of this ratio, all of these cancel out. Let's next add the value for the lengths and radii. The centimeters and millimeters cancel out, and this computes to about 21. In other words, a central line port has about 21 times the resistance as a 16 gauge IV. Therefore, IV fluids will infuse about 21 times as fast through the IV compared to a central line. Of course, we could simultaneously infuse fluid through all three points of a central line, but this would still leave us with a max central line infusion rate of one seventh that of the IV. This result initially surprises a lot of healthcare providers who are just starting their clinical careers. Central lines seem like so much more definitive and preferred as access that it initially seems counterintuitive that a simple IV would be better for something, but when it comes to rapid infusion of fluids, it is. For anyone with first-hand experience in these situations, you probably suspect the ratio isn't quite that lopsided in real life, and that's because the IV tubing from the bag 
contributes to some of the overall resistance to the system equally in both scenarios. Another situation in which this comes up is when a patient is about to receive a CT angiogram. A CT angiogram requires the IV contrast to be injected at a fairly quick rate by a machine, and most forms of central axis are unable to manage the flow rate, often necessitating the patient having a standard large gauge IV. Let's see Poisier used in a completely different medical context. Here we have a pair of lungs. Air moves back and forth from the outside world and the alveoli in each of the lungs uh, through both the trachea and bronchi. If a patient has an asthma attack and the airway radius is reduced by a modest sounding 25%, by how much is airway resistance affected? And before any physiology purists start posting nasty comments, the increased resistance in the airways during an asthma attack occurs in the medium sized airways, not in the trachea and main stem bronchi as the picture shows. Let's do the same type of analysis as we did in the last situation and look at the ratio of the airway resistance during the attack to the resistance at baseline. Nearly everything cancels and we can replace the value for radius during the attack with three quarters radius at baseline. When this is calculated, we find the ratio to be just above three. In other words, when airway radius is reduced by a modest sounding 25%, airway resistance increases to 300% baseline. You can imagine why asthmatics struggle so hard to breathe during an attack. We'll actually revisit uh, fluid dynamics in an asthma attack in the next video. The relevance of Poisier's law in medicine does not only involve changes in the radius of a conduit. Poisier's law can also become relevant with derangements in blood viscosity. There are two major subtypes of situations in which there exists a clinically relevant increase in blood viscosity. The first is known as the hyperviscosity syndrome, which is a complication of conditions such as Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and multiple myeloma, in which the underlying problem is too much circulating plasma proteins, usually either fibrinogen or immunoglobulins, represented here by the little rainbow specks. The only way to get rid of them is plasmapheresis, in which blood is removed from the body, filtered to remove substances of large molecular weight, such as proteins, and reintroduced back into the body. This buys time for chemotherapy to provide a more definitive long-term treatment. The second major subtype is leukostasis, which is a complication of leukemia, in which there are just too many white blood cells. The absolute number of white blood cells isn't the only important value here, but also how sticky those cells are, which explains why a patient with chronic leukemia can have no symptoms of hyperviscosity at a white blood cell count of 200,000, but a patient with acute leukemia can have severe symptoms at a white cell count of 100,000. The best treatment here is immediate chemotherapy. The symptoms of elevated viscosity in both syndromes are largely overlapping and include headache, blurred vision, confusion, somnolence, mucosal hemorrhage, and ataxia. Both conditions um, have high mortality rates if not identified and treated immediately. For the most part, direct measurements of viscosity do not correlate well with severity of symptoms, and although the hyperviscosity syndrome and leukostasis are important diagnostic entities, qualitative measurements of viscosity have not gained widespread acceptance as a clinically useful test. That concludes this video on Poisier's Law. The next video will cover turbulence.